Good morning. My name is Isan Taylor with I Love the Berg, and I'd like to welcome everyone to our next installment of the History Half Hour. These free history tours are made possible in part by the City of St. Petersburg and the St. Petersburg Downtown Partnership, with a special thanks to the St. Petersburg Museum of History. We're about to get started with today's host, Monica Kyle, who's live in front of the Craftsman House located on Central Avenue and 30th Street to start our historic Kenwood tour. Her husband, John Kyle's running the presentation for us today. So we're gonna get a cool mix of live footage as well as slides with historic photos. We hope you enjoy. If you have a question during our live tour, please feel free to use the comments section. We're gonna do our best to work in as many of your questions during the live tour as possible. Once again, thank you for joining us and be sure to follow I Love the Bird on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and TikTok, as well as subscribing to our newsletter to stay up to date on our next history tour, the latest news, exclusive offers, and all things good in the Berg. Monica, good morning. Thank you so much. Hi, Isa, how are you? I'm fabulous. This is my you're, favorite. Uh, you're probably a lot cooler than, uh, than Andrew and I are out here on Central Avenue. We are in the historic Kenwood neighborhood. We've done this at 10 o'clock in the morning to try and um, not totally expire while we're walking through the heat. I mean, it's actually, I have to say, quite pleasant underneath the shade here. We are in front of the Craftsman House Gallery, which we're going to talk about in just a minute, where we're starting off our tour of historic Kenwood today. Um, Kenwood is a charming neighborhood, probably best well or most well known for its large collection of craftsman bungalows. But what I find interesting about Kenwood is that it really, it, it covers a lot of ground in terms of the history of St. Pete. It's almost like an intersection of eras and and geography in St. Pete. Uh, it spans really, you can study the decades of the 20s and 30s when the neighborhood was developed by Charles Hall. You can also look at the 1950s and kind of what happens in St. Pete with our huge post-war boom and people moving away from downtown. It's really this interesting nexus of St. Pete's stories. And we're really just gonna scratch the surface of it today. Kenwood is a very large neighborhood. In fact, John, why don't you throw up a map and kind of show them where we are and where we're going to be going today? Yeah, this um, first map is uh, kind of the, the downtown area of St. Petersburg and that that lighter gray section there is, is the greater historic Kenwood, which is like a national register district, which Monica will get into. Um, within uh, St. Petersburg, we have 10 local historic districts, which offer a little more protection. And if this is any indication how special Kenwood is, four of those districts are in Kenwood. So Monica is down here at the Craftsman House down near the bottom of this, this map. And she's gonna kind of wind up around the park in Kenwood, Seminole Park, uh, down through the neighborhood a little bit through past a few example homes and some interesting people and ending up at St. Petersburg High. Um, and that's, that's kind of the path we're gonna take roughly. Perfect, thank you, John. The thing I want you to keep in mind when we're going through Kenwood today is that it's really the year round neighborhood of St. Pete. A lot of the other neighborhoods we've toured on the history half hour, places like the Old Northeast and Roser Park and even Round Lake were more seasonal. They were designed for wealthy Northerners who were coming down either to retire or to just spend their winter here They'd be here for the best days, the best winter days, and then they'd get out in the dog days of summer like we're in right now. But somebody has to run the city. Somebody has to be the school teachers and the government workers and the insurance salesmen. And those people migrate to Kenwood. And that's because it's affordable, that we have a lot of modest bungalows that we're gonna talk about. Um, and because we have so many year round residents in this area, we also get a lot of the commercial businesses that will cater to year round residents. So we get things like, vacuum repair shops, washing machine repair shops, along the commercial corridors of Central Avenue, First Avenue North. Um, just in the 10 block span between 20th and 30th, there's 11 filling stations. In fact, um, Andrew, you can see one of them behind me. One of the things I love about Kenwood and the Grand Central District, a lot of these old filling stations or gas stations have now been converted into cool little restaurants and bars. Um, you'll see it all over. Um, in fact, I had, I had heard at one point that they toyed with the idea of calling it Gasoline Alley because of all these cool restored gas stations. Nobody likes that name, but I think it's kind of cool. Um, so this is the year round neighborhood. I'm standing 
now in front of the model home for the Kenwood neighborhood. And we're going to talk about the name of Kenwood in just a minute. But when the uh, neighborhood was originally laid out by Charles Hall as Hall's Central is what he called the area, um, he built this home to uh, to display to potential residents. Jeff, why don't you come on down here and I'll get you to talk a little bit about uh, the Craftsman House Gallery. It's now an art studio gallery. We're going to meet the owner, Jeff Shore. I'm going to transfer my AirPods to him so that you can hear him better. We're going to spend about uh, two or three minutes here with Jeff learning about the house and the gallery. So, right ear, left ear. Uh, okay. Hello. Hey, Jeff, Hi. we can hear Jeff you. Shore. Great. I'm Jeff Shore from Craftsman House Gallery. We've been here 20 years now, the first 12 years alone. <laughs> and over the last eight years, we've seen the, the Renaissance of St. Pete really go into high gear. Uh, the, it was built, as Monica said, as a model home for the historic Kenwood neighborhood back in 1918. And it was built on Central Avenue just so more people would see it rather than back into the neighborhood. Uh, you'll notice as you go through the neighborhood, corner lots like this were often double lots. So there's bigger houses often on the corner lots. Uh, but a lot of the typical architectural details that you would see in craftsman bungalows, it's got. Yeah, it's well, well this one has a little oriental flair with the three uh, peaks on the roof lines. So you got the big front porch wrapping around with the columns, the different brackets. You can see the middle ones are actually were called canoe brackets because it kind of curls up in the shape of a canoe. It's got the Cuban tile on the on the floor. And you know, during the pandemic, we had some time in our hands. And after years and years of people saying, oh, I drove by the place and, and missed it, you know, we decided to give it more vibrant colors. So we painted it the colorful purple and, and blue and orange that you see here. And it, uh, it, it proves as you, if you wanna landmark something, whether it's a neighborhood or a specific building that you can paint it whatever color because you want. This is a local historic landmark. This is a local historic landmark, yes. So did you get tax breaks when you redid it? We we did get some when we did, redid it. Yeah. Let's, can we go inside, Jeff? Yeah, we can go inside. Again, here's the, the Cuban tile. Now the, the gallery itself, we represent over 300 plus American artists. You know, it's been transformed into an art gallery with a cafe. And we were about three quarters national artists and a quarter local artists. And then of course, outside the old carriage house is transformed into a working pottery studio. And that was another thing of that era is people tried to extend their living space into the outdoors. So a lot of them had courtyards where they would actually spend a lot of time there and they would put things that would make them comfortable. You mentioned the, um, the, the sunroom. sunroom to me. Andrew, take a, a peek over here too, we may get a moment. Cause I tell them why they would add these sunrooms and I think it's interesting. Yeah, a lot of, at that point in time, you know, late teens, early twenties, tuberculosis was prevalent in the United States and doctors would recommend a lot of sun and, and sitting. So. They built these sunrooms or sitting rooms in a lot of the homes so people could just sit there and rest. They were or sometimes called reading rooms. So talk about the fireplace. Well, just like today's model homes, they show you what you, not exactly, <laughs> today they do it exactly, but then they would show you things you could do in your home, whether it was a built-in or the columns or the fireplace. Now this fireplace, the, the builder, one of his best friends was a local gravestone maker. So they, incorporated the granite into the fireplace and in many you know even being florida you know many homes did have fireplaces there and jeff you have and a cafe jeff, as well you have a gallery cafe as well yeah the cafe is further back here where the kitchen was and we tried when when i renovated we tried to keep everything intact as much as we could there are certain things we had to upgrade um you know, ADA in the in the bathrooms. And, and here we, we knocked out the wall to make the half wall and put the counter in and basically tried to put 50 pounds in a 10 pound bag back here. But we have a you know full lunch menu, full espresso, 
coffee bar, beer, wine, loose leaf teas. And, and everything we serve on is made here in the pottery yeah, that's studio. Cool. That's great. All right, I'm going to thank you very much for having us today. I'm going to steal my AirPods back for you. And we're going to go into the neighborhood itself. Um, is there, there's a sister house to this one too that we're going to see on second. Now, do you think that person modeled it? Like said, I want that one because they saw this house. Well, you know, how stories go, it was the builder's mistress. Oh, really? Whether, oh. That's, whether that's true or not. The, and I don't know if you guys caught that, but they say uh, yeah. the, house, the house that we'll see, that's the sister house to this was, you know, reputedly built for the builder's mistress, which I love. Thank you, Jeff. We appreciate you having us. Um, Jeff mentioned, John, that they built it here because you could see, you know, they built the model home here along Central because you'd be able to see it through the main thoroughfare. And Right. So Jeff is pointing out that the second story, which you can see if Andrew backs up a little bit, was built like many homes in the 1920s as sleeping quarters in the summer because it would be so hot and there's no air conditioning. So you'd go up there, you'd have your sleeping quarters where the wind would, you know, could you'd catch a breeze. Um, I was saying about the trolley, the Central Avenue with, you know, the main thoroughfare. As early as 1904, St. Petersburg installed a streetcar line that by 1913 is actually going all the way out to Boca Ciega Bay, even though there's really nothing beyond 9th Street for many, many years. Charles Hall develops this neighborhood in 1912, shortly after the streetcar line is opening. Uh, John, put up the map of the streetcar line because I think it's kind of interesting. Yeah. Do you have that up? We do. Yeah. So up in the northeast corner, you can see it says Coffee Pot. That's where the old northeast is. So you can see there's trolley lines through there. And then the middle line that goes through kind of the middle of the page, that's the Central Avenue trolley line out to Boca Ciega Bay. Um, now, you know, we're putting in these bus lanes on First Avenues North and South. And gosh, don't we wish we just still had the trolleys, which they took out in 1947. Um, interesting thing about the trolleys, when they would hit 30th Street, where I am right now, they oftentimes were stopped because of flooding in this area that was known as the Goose Pond. So between 30th Street and 35th, so we think of 34th now as a major thoroughfare, so I think just one, one street past that, between 5th Ave South and 5th Ave North was a low-lying area of muck land that became known as the Goose Pond. It was very rich, so farmers loved it. You had a lot of truck farms, meaning, you know, the farmers didn't live on the property. They came and they farmed the land. They carried the um, vegetables and produce out in their trucks. Um, a large contingent of actually Japanese American farmers um, in this area who during World War II actually had their ax heads taken away um, because of concerns of, you know, an uprising. But a large contingent of Japanese American farmers and other truck farmers so this area was so low that it would often flood. So when it did, the trolley would have to stop here. There'd be another trolley waiting on the other side of the goose pond. And Walter Fuller, one of the big real estate agents at the time, would actually use rowboats to ferry prospective buyers across the flooded area. When it wasn't flooded, it had a tendency to catch on fire because it was so rich with nutrients. So it was really this dead zone in the middle of town for a very long time until the 1950s. So I, I mentioned at the beginning of the tour that, you know, Kenwood is this interesting sort of nexus temporally or chronologically as well as geographically. Um, in the 1950s, this area starts to get developed. John, I'm gonna walk into the neighborhood. Why don't you tell them about what happened to the Goose Pond area during the 1950s while we walked down to Seminole Park? Yeah, well, the 1950s was uh, the post-war boom in St. Petersburg. We had plans for the Sunshine Skyway and US-19, and this was pre-interstate. So St. Petersburg, at the time, had always been connected through Tampa. US-19 was going to connect St. Petersburg directly with Erie, Pennsylvania, uh, and Pittsburgh, and, and major cities all in, in between. And... Uh, the developers saw opportunity out in this area with this farming area, and they built the first major shopping complex in St. Petersburg um, when big shopping complexes were, were becoming uh, common, more common in the United States, and that was Central Plaza. And Central Plaza opened in 1952 um, 
essentially where the YMCA is, um, between where Monica was at the Crescent House and the YMCA on First Half South is, on the day that it opened, it is said that St. Petersburg did more retail than any other city in the country. 30 to 50,000 people showed up. The, the complex was anchored by a Belk Lindsay department store, which stayed its entire, the entire uh, lifetime of Central Plaza had that Belk Lindsay. There was a Publix, there was an A&P, there was uh, shoe stores, there was a Wolfie's Delicatessen, which a lot of people speak fondly of. Um, but to really understand St. Petersburg during that time, you have to know that this was the shopping hub. And so you had Kenwood right next door, so close that, you know, Monica has only been walking for a minute or two, and she's going to be in the heart of the neighborhood where she was at the edge of Central Plaza just a moment ago. And uh, of course, Central Plaza falls into um, you know less favor as bigger shopping centers are starting to develop out by Tyrone. And this is all the westward flight out of downtown. And by the 70s, um, Central Plaza is, is falling out of favor. And, um, and it really takes another 20 years before it gets redeveloped where you have the YMCA. Another section of that area was owned by the school board. Uh, so in the late 50s, the school board owned a bunch of land out there that they'd bought for like $50,000 and they wanted to resell it at like a 1400% uh, profit because the land prices had changed so much. And it was a big debate on whether or not the school board should be essentially land speculating. Should they bought that with tax dollars? Shouldn't the city be able to buy it and turn it into a civic area, like a civic center and athletic fields? But they did sell it, and it was an expansion of, of Central Plaza. Did you mute me, John? I'm muted for a moment. It was a little, it was a little muted windy. me. Sorry, love. Oh, were you trying <laughs> to talk? Friend. I was trying to talk, and that's okay. Um, uh, yeah, Sorry. I, I, I felt the wind. I was like, John, John, you were, you were responding. Because I just wanted what to point miss? out. This, well, I wanted to point I, I wanted you to keep talking, but I do want to point out this one house before we go. We're on, yeah. this is Second Avenue North, which we're actually going to come back to on the other side. And Andrew, if you point down that way, you can really start to get a glimpse of the cool bungalows. The house I'm standing in front of, 2963, is actually an American four square. Um, more than 50% of the, we'll walk this way, of the bungalows in Kenwood are, um, or of the houses in Kenwood are actually craftsman bungalows. But there are others like American four square, Colonial Revival. There's a number of Tudor style. Um, this house, I think, is most notable for the person that lived in it, a man named George Young, who was a kind of a civil engineer. Um, I wouldn't go as far as to call him a developer, but he kind of laid out the neighborhoods. Um, Charles Hall, the developer of the Kenwood neighborhood, hired George Young to lay out Lakewood Estates for him, which Charles Hall also developed. Um, and that's what brought George Young here to St. Pete. George Young then becomes a very popular engineer throughout the state of Florida and opens up, ends up opening up eight offices throughout the state of Florida, kind of laying out these different neighborhoods and cities, really. So he ends up laying out most of the beaches between Grill and Reddington Beach. Uh, but he lived in that house. He lived in that house for about uh, most of the 20s is what I have read. Um, he, during the bust, when everybody, you know, the 1926, Florida's real estate market goes bust about three years before the rest of the country enters the Great Depression. Um, he moves out of that house. He has built a hotel called the Mary Jean. John, do you, if you get a chance, throw up those pictures of the Mary Jean Hotel, which is still standing on Central Avenue at about 23rd Street. Um, so he's built the Mary Jean Hotel, which is really a, a transition between the boarding houses of the 19 teens that you'll find around Round Lake um, and the larger hotels like the Vinoy or the Dante's are out at the beach that we'll get later. So you get this sort of medium sized hotel. So George Young owns and operates that um, between 1926 and about 19, either 34 or 36. So during the bust, he moves into a small house that's next door to the Mary Jean that's owned by the hotel. That's now the Metro um wellness center inclusive wellness center um so just an interesting example of the type of year-round 
people that lived here in St. Pete or lived here in Kenwood. Andrew, we're walking now past Seminole Park. So I want you to get a good view of the park. And as we're walking, I want to, throughout the rest of this bit, I want to make sure you focused on some of the houses um, that we're going to be walking past. John, Come I wanted on. to touch I want to on... mention really quick, Mon, that George Young is the namesake of George F. Young Engineering, yeah. which is still on MLK. And he didn't have any children. So he left a business behind that is thriving to this day. And also he left a huge trust for the Methodist church and built like 27 churches. Yeah, it's fast. He's really a fascinating guy. You start doing these tours and these research and you delve into, you know, we drive past that George F. Young building all the time. Um, I wanted to add when you were talking about the, the school board in Central Plaza, you know, that, that debate about whether or not the school board uh, would sell its land back to the city was very contentious. In the the St. Pete Times was really advocating that the school board was sort of duty bound to sell, to keep that land in the public trust, in the public interest, so that it was obligated really to sell it to the city so that the city could, there was talk about putting parkland there, maybe a civic center. Um, there's a newspaper article, John, that we clipped that shows you know, they proposed having like a big civic center that had a track in it in the middle of town. Mm -hmm. Wouldn't that be great? Um, so it really was a loss and it kind of set a precedent that, you know, one government entity really didn't, wasn't obligated to, um, you know, hold its land in trust for the city. And I think it set a bad precedent. I think, of, you know, that because that area now includes the post office and the Walmart neighborhood store, how much nicer that part of town could be if we had kept it in the public trust and you know maybe put a park there andrew we are standing on the corner of um let's see we're on third and third avenue north and 30th street i want you to film this street sign right here because this street sign really tells you a lot about the evolution of kenwood you'll notice it's this pretty historic looking um street sign with the scrolls and you know kind of almost wrought iron look and then it's got this cool sculpture on the side of it of a grasshopper or a lover as we call them here locally this street sign and the attached finial they call it um are the result of efforts of the historic kenwood neighborhood association and i'm going to talk more about them later but they're really responsible for the turnaround that ends up happening in Kenwood in the 90s after that period of decline that that John mentioned in the 60s and 70s 70s and 80s really where the neighborhood really starts to decline historic Kenwood Neighborhood Association does a lot of things that we'll talk about over the course of the tour to bring it back these street signs are one example you know they look like somebody cares they put effort into making the neighborhood look charming and I'll talk about the attached finial in a moment but I want to walk to the other side of the street and Andrew, as I walk down Third Avenue, I want you to kind of focus on these craftsman bungalows that line Seminole Park. So this is all around the edges of this park are one of the local historic districts that are located in Kenwood. And it's basically all the houses around the park are a small local historic district. And there's a huge concentration of craftsman bungalows. I'll, I'll talk more about craftsman bungalows in just a moment. but. Something I want to point out about these ones in particular, a lot of them have, I don't want to walk up on this person's property, but if you look at the column that's holding up the, the porch supports, you can see the column is kind of tapered down at the bottom. That's a it's called a battered column where it sort of tapers up to the top. And then on top of the bottom portion, there's a brick pier supporting the roof support. Often in Craftsman bungalows, that top part of the column is made of wood or um, concrete. In a lot of these instances around Seminole Park, the top portion is made of brick. And that's one of the hallmark um, characteristics of a house that's built by a man named A.A. A. Stebbins. So he's one of the builders, the early builders in St. Petersburg. He ends up building 15 houses a year for like... <laughs> 30 years or some long period of time, he built a huge number of houses in St. Pete and a huge, I think a hundred something in Kenwood itself. So again, you see the brick piers here, uh, probably an A.A. Stebbins house. Stebbins becomes a huge city booster as well, because I think all these early developers realize that, you know, the more they promote the city, the more people are going to move here and the more business they're going to have. This is a great one. Um, again, you can see the brick columns. 
So Stebbins, you know, he's making good money. He donates a thousand dollars to the Chamber of Commerce. He has this great idea that the city should buy or the chamber should buy a Pullman car, you know, a train car that can tour throughout the United States and promote the Sunshine City. So they have a contest to name the Pullman car. They call it the Sunshine Pullman car. It travels for four or five years throughout the U.S. with the Scottish Highlands Band. Later, they call themselves the Williams Park Band. And they go and they hold concerts throughout the U.S. and promote St. Petersburg. Um, John, there's a picture. Actually, there's a couple of slides I have in there. Um, yeah, we've got the AA, picture. Uh, of AA uh, Stebbins. There's my dog. There's Echo. <laughs> um, of AA Stebbins' daughter, Ruth, christening the, um, the Pullman car. There's also, John, a slide of A.A. Stebbins wrote a, an article in a builder magazine promoting the bungalow lifestyle. And he uses pictures of one of the houses that he built here in Kenwood and talks about, you know, the airy porches and how you can have this outdoor lifestyle like Jeff was talking about. And there is a fireplace, but you barely need it. You'll just use it a couple of times a year to, you know, for the charm and coziness of it. Here's a really good example of a craftsman bungalow got the big porch. I mean, that porch is big enough. They have a table for six people on it. Um, it's got the gabled roof. So I always think of a gabled roof as kind of being like a gingerbread house. You know, it comes to the peak. They have exposed rafter tails. So this part of the rafter, you know, that's holding up the roof, that red portion there, you know, the rafters hold the roof up. In most houses, you don't see the rafters, but in craftsman bungalows, they expose the rafter tails. And often they'll have kind of a decorative, you know, curly cue in the instance of Jeff's house or Jeff's gallery. It had those canoe brackets. Um, one of the things that the Historic Kenwood Neighborhood Association did early on was to encourage people. A lot of the houses had been, or a lot of the porches had been enclosed, like you can see this one is. This one at least has really nice, um, gla it's glassed in. Um, but one of the things that the neighborhood association did early on was to encourage people to open their porches back up. So you'll notice almost all those houses we passed just a minute ago, their porches are open. And they gave a small grant that would kind of encourage people to do that. I think it was like $500 in the early days that if they would open their porch back up, you know, they could get this grant to do so. I want to point out, John, um, notice this artist enclave sign. You see that, Andrew, right there? We're going to talk about that in just a yeah. moment. Um, but this is a good example, and we're going to come back to that. Across the way here, uh, again, Seminole Park is right in the middle of the neighborhood. It's eight acres. It was donated by Charles Hall in 1913, you know, a year or so after Charles Hall buys the land and plats the beginnings of what becomes Kenwood. So Charles Hall is a milliner, a hat maker from Philadelphia. He's lured here by F.A. Davis. There's a huge connection between St. Pete and Philadelphia. Hamilton Diston, who originally owned all this land that St. Pete is on, uh, that's not true, Williams owned it, but owned a lot of the land in the, this part of Florida, was originally from Philadelphia, and he had a lot of connections uh, to, you know, developers in Philadelphia, so he brought a lot of them down here. So Charles Hall is one of the people from Philadelphia that comes down. He buys land from Walter Fuller, plats out what he calls, so we're going to turn, turn on Burlington, what he calls Charles or Hall's Central. Um, John, why don't you show those ads? Yeah. Like early developments. They're fun. Yeah, we've got a, a picture of Charles Hall and then one of his ads. That, now, the area heading out there, you know, before it was Central, it kind of became a commercial area when it was sort of on the outskirts of town. It was sort of uh, undesirable. Obviously, it headed off into a mucky farm. And Charles Hall ran this ad. Really, I like it's My hat's in the ring. He's a hat maker. But <laughs> that's great. It's really like saying, hey, we're bought. There's a northern syndicate. Me and my friends are buying all this land up. We're going to clear out these people and we're going to um, make it commercial and we're going to put this great neighborhood here. So, you know, trust me, I would never sell the substandard land. And uh, and then this ad is great because instead of go west, young man, he's like, go west, everybody to the top of the hill. There have been some storms, some flooding. Uh, high ground was coveted and Charles Hall had it. I think they uh, they started selling it for a couple hundred bucks a lot. Um, and all the lots were the same, he said. Um, 
And yeah, it was uh, like two hundred and twenty. Two hundred and twenty-two dollars, and I think I don't know. I can't remember if you paid a, up front. You got a half off or something. It was yeah, they had all kinds of um, gimmicks. So, John, I want to point out this. This is one of my favorite bungalows. Uh, so, the Craftsman Bungalow is really coined in California by two brothers, the Green Brothers, who are building these grand, high-style, very large. Uh, decorative craftsman bungalows, but they realize very quickly that it can be scaled down to a more modest sized house. It becomes known as the bungalow, the more modest sized house. But it has these, there's a real connection between the earth um, and nature. It's almost a repudiation of the Victorian era where you had all that decorative gingerbread. You're kind of getting away from that and you're showing almost the function, the form of the house. Uh, this one, in addition to the battered columns, you see how it tapers up from the bottom. And then the, the brackets or the corbels that are holding up the porch, they're so pretty. You know, they're very simple, but they're very elegant. These underneath the gabled roof on this side, those braces that are holding it up kind of at an angle, that's called a knee brace. That's another typical thing you'll see in a craftsman house. The windows in this house are great. You've got multi-paned windows. So usually you'll describe a window by the number of panes that are on the top against the number of panes that are on the bottom. This one you can't do that with because they're you know, three, three by three by three, I guess I would call that almost. Um, but they've preserved their original windows. The houses are earth toned. So, you know, Je Jeff mentioned he painted his these kind of crazy colors, which is really not the craftsman style, which would have been these muted colors. Um, but we're going to talk about what that, how he's allowed to do that with the landmark um, in just a minute. But John, I also want to point out this one over here. And you found out some interesting things. This one just has such a cool roof line. Um, and I don't even know what that's called, but again, they've got these great battered columns. And then there's brick, which I wonder if Stebbins built this one. You can see the windows here are, they're actually probably replacement windows. Um, and that piece in the middle is probably not a real divided light, but they've got four over one. Um, which you, you see, yeah, I think those are replacement windows, but they've done a nice job and that they look like they might be original. John, you found out some interesting stuff about the P and there's a, they have an art yeah. enclave sign in their window as well. And then the, the people in that house and this house too, right? Yeah. That's, you know, as we go through these neighborhoods and we find some cool houses and we try to research and a lot of times you don't come up with a lot, but that one had an interesting during world war two, uh, the, the son of Harry Smith goes off to war. He's a radio operator on a B-25. He comes home in 43 um, after 50 missions over Italy, uh, mostly wanting to talk about ice cream and Coca-Cola because that's what he missed because he's practically a kid fighting World War II. Um, but he also talks about how they were so explicitly told not to bomb the Vatican. Uh, they were, had to be able to be very careful not to damage anything in the Vatican as they were bombing Rome. Um, and his sister, uh, when she got married the same year, um, reading through uh, her wedding announcement, uh, or her, uh, actually after her wedding, uh, the music was provided by their neighbors, who were also an interesting uh, crew, uh, the Mellers. Uh, Frank Meller was an uh, Italian bel canto uh, opera singer, and they ran a, a studio teaching uh, opera singing out of that home. And they, he was he was kind of semi-famous up in New York until he kind of retired, not completely when they came to St. Petersburg. And he and his wife were, were kind of a pair. Um, I fell deep into a rabbit hole. I found an old recording on, a, on an archive website of him in a quartet. Um, but uh, just really interesting people. And then later on at that, that same home, there was an astronomer who was kind of a known guy who liked to give talks around town. His son went off to Georgia Tech. Uh, his daughter um, is pictured here as she's about to go off to the Florida State College for Women, which eventually became FSU. Um, just really uh, interesting uh, people sometimes that you uncover in these houses and the relationships that exist between them. Um, just uh, Yeah, John, I wanted, hold on, I'm trying to find the, oh, here we go. There's a, um, a piece of information I found in one of the, landmark applications or district applications that talked about they had they'd gone through that we're going to talk about this house they had gone through the city directories and found out what people's occupations were in kenwood for the years between 1920 and 1947 and they were occupations such as contractor painter salesman 
bookkeepers, policemen, carpenters. So you can see it, you know, again, these the type of people that would be here year round that are kind of making your city tick. This house is the one that is the sister to uh, the Craftsman House Gallery. And you can see it also has the canoe brackets, both kind of running um, this way and holding the, the gables up, the roof lines up. You noticed on Jeff's house, they had the, the gables come to a peak. They do that on these first two, but that third story up there, they've kind of flattened that out. I wonder if they've enlarged that. That would have been that sort of airplane. It's known as an airplane bungalow because that pop, that part that pops up there is kind of like the cockpit. So this is just a beautiful example that actually won a historic preservation award for its restoration a few years ago in 2014. Next door, again, talking about the interesting people that lived in Kenwood. And actually, Andrew, before we cover that, film that house over there because it's so pretty with the, um, the wood columns and the, the brick porch. So next door, and there actually were two houses here, here and here where the fence is originally. One of them has been torn down. But here lived a man named Jay Liberty Tad, who I was not familiar with before I started doing research for this tour. And actually, it's probably one of the more interesting people to pass through St. Petersburg and could really uh, be credited with both Kenwood and the city of St. Pete being known as this arts destination. So Jay Liberty Tad, and John, put up those pictures that I have of him. He was from, um, I want to say the Adirondacks area and the New York area. I think he was originally from Philadelphia, but then opened an, a summer art school in the Philadelphia area or somewhat, somewhere up north, uh, northeast. And he really believed in kind of the practical applications of art. And he was an early um, adherent to the idea of the right and the left side of the brain. And he would kind of try to teach people to paint with both sides. He believed that art could be applied to industrial applications. So, um, you know, for practical uses, he was an early advocate for women and minorities, you know, coming into the art. And he came to St. Pete and started a winter art school. He had his summer art school up north and he started a winter art school in 1916. And then unfortunately dies the very next year. But his winter art school is founded on the, in a lease building on the corner of Beach Drive and Second Avenue North. So think of that big, beautiful Kapok tree um, in front of the Museum of Fine Arts. That's where his winter art school was. When he dies, his wife and daughter keep the school going. And then they also start an art club of St. Petersburg, which becomes this really kind of vital organization that starts to attract a lot of attention. Uh, people start coming to St. Petersburg and thinking of it as an art city. That art club eventually grows into the Morian Center for Art. Um, but it's really the first time that St. Petersburg, I mean, and this is early, this is in the 19 teens, early 1920s, is being identified as a city of the arts. And we can really owe that to Jay Liberty Tad and his wife, I think her name was Edith, um, and the daughter, maybe the daughter was Edith. Um, but really, you know, interesting people, and they lived here in, in Kenwood too. John, I'm just going to go around the corner to the Nolan's Grocery, and then I think we should probably end it there because we're getting pretty close to 10:45. Okay, yeah, I was going to uh, also there... add just that uh, you know at the same time as Jay Liberty Tad, Mar uh, Mark Dixon Dodd, who helped develop Driftwood, was here, and just about any time one was mentioned, they were they were at all the same art, art parties together. Um, so uh, that is really the roots. Of, like you know, over a hundred years ago, this became an arts place, and, and to this day, Kenwood's a big reason for that. Well, and it, 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 whenever I read these things, it always reminds me like how exciting and interesting it would have been to, to be here in those years. And you, know, you could really uh, leave your mark on a city. And I'm, I'm, when we finish up here in a second, I'm going to talk about people that, who have left their mark on Kenwood in recent years. Um, Andrew, just show some of these bungalows as we, as we walk past. We're going to the, the one-time home of a man named Paul Nolan who was the proprietor of Nolan's Grocery, which was on First Avenue North at around 23rd Street. So the same block actually as the Mary Jean Hotel, but on the next street over. Um, Nolan had opened it, it, Nolan's Grocery, and John, share the pictures of Nolan's Grocery. Mm -hmm. So this is where he lived here at 2727. Again, modest bungalow. He was a grocer. He owned um, a couple of small markets, and, you know, in the 1920s, 
groceries were not what we think of them today. They were all really sort of specialized store. You'd go to the baker, you'd go to the butcher, um, you'd go to the dry goods store. And eventually, as we get closer to the 30s, there's this evolution to a larger, what we think of today as a supermarket. And Paul Nolan makes that transition from the small markets. He had one along 9th Street, actually right across from the George Young engineering firm today. Um, and he makes that transition. He opens a larger grocery store on First Avenue North that is built by the city's first architect, Edgar Ferndon, who lived right Ferdin, who lived right across the street from Nolan. Um, and again, you know, all of these kind of year-round people lived here in Kenwood. Um, so Nolan makes this transition to this larger supermarket, which he runs for 20 or 30 years, then he sells it, and about 10 years later, 1950s. Central Plaza opens and Nolan's Grocery goes out of business because of the Publix um, in Central Plaza. So again, sort of this um, evolution of the Kenwood neighborhood, really it's kind of a microcosm of what happens in larger St. Pete. Another I just threw up a picture of Nolan's Grocery as it stands today. Today, yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, and it's owned, the building is owned, it's now, there's some businesses down at the bottom, but it's now lofts, like apartments, owned by Bob Jeffrey, who is one of the sort of crucial people in the revitalization of the Kenwood neighborhood. And um, I wanted to, oh, I thought it was this corner. Um, here's another great bungalow across the way there. Oh, it is this corner. So I wanted to end here because there's another one of these finials and just talk a little bit about, you know, these, these finials again are made here by artists who I believe are artists from the Artist Enclave. John, tell, talk a little bit about what the Artist Enclaves are in Kenwood. Yeah, the Artist Enclave, basically, you know, somewhere um, over the years, someone said, oh, we shouldn't be, uh, you know, running businesses out of our homes. And it actually made it uh, more difficult for people to create art uh, and teach and do things out of their homes that we might have, you know, thought of being a normal activity. And actually, passed, uh, I think it was 2014, the Artist Enclaves, which allowed uh, working artists to use home space with kilns, um, some of the, the equipment that might be, you know, a little less typical in, in a home area. And there are rules, like you can't be too close to the, the fence with your kiln and noise levels and everything. But it allowed people to come in and, and be artists in the community. Um, and the other side of that is Kenwood has its own Artist Enclave organization the i'll give you the name exact um because they have a very good website it's that on the historic kenwood.org website artist enclave of historic kenwood and right. they're an organization that supports um and and they work together every march third saturday in march they have a a tour of of, of their homes where they, they show off their art uh they're everything from you know uh, sculptors and, and potters singers um you know, you name it, uh, they're tutors, you know, people who, who teach, people who do um, all kinds of metal work. You know, it's, it's a, it, there's a, a wide array of, of, of things that are, that are included in that. Well, and John, I think what's important to note about the artist enclave and kind of the note that I want to end the tour on today is that, you know, that effort to get the, the zoning overlay to have the artist enclave was an effort of the neighborhood association and the people that lived here. And, mm -hmm. you know, there was a period of decline, real decline in Kenwood when the interstate came through on the Eastern edge, um, you know, there's development happening at Central Plaza, 34th street, the, the houses start to deteriorate. There's a lot of drug activity. And in the early nineties, you know, a lot of people started moving in young families because it was affordable. Um, a lot of gay people because, you know, they're sort of a marginalized community and they're going to go to a marginalized part of town. And they begin to say, no, you know, this is our neighborhood and we're going to take it back. And they encouraged a lot of the older longtime residents to kind of fight for their neighborhood. And they began doing things like the street sign. That was a little bit later. But, the, you know, the opening of the porches, they had a lot of activities, events in Seminole Park, things that created community and created eyes on the street. If you've got open front porches, people are sitting on them. They can watch for crime. I mean, look at this great, although you probably can't see crime because this, this lawn is so... Uh, so beautifully landscaped, but you know, the idea is that you've got people sitting on their porch, they can see, you know, eyes on the street and they're take, helping take care of your house. So 
Kenwood is really kind of a master class in how to revitalize a neighborhood. And I don't think it's too far fetched to say that what happened in Kenwood with the revitalization that started in the 90s and the early 2000s helped spur what has happened in the larger St. Pete because, you know, that trickles over people like Jeff Shore, who opened the Craftsman House Gallery 20 years ago on Central Avenue. People like Jeff Danner, who was the council representative for this neighborhood and who has been tireless in the uh, efforts to promote Kenwood. You know, to this day, Jeff still makes the clamps that hold the finials onto the street signs. I mean, these are people that are just doing this because they love the neighborhood, they love the area, they love their neighbors, they want to see it promoted. So it's really a beautiful example of how you can kind of take back your neighborhood by uh, banding together with your neighbors. I hope we've given you a little taste of Kenwood. I think we were overly ambitious. We actually had plans to get all the way down to the high school uh, down on fifth, but I've realized that that's two separate tours now. So that'll be Kenwood part two. Um, I did want to talk about the local historic districts. Years ago, Kenwood was designated a national register historic district in 2003. So that's that larger area that John showed on the first map in the past few years, smaller pockets of Kenwood have um, designated themselves as local historic districts in an effort to prevent demolitions of some of these smaller bungalows because with all the, the attention that's coming to St. Pete, developers want to come in here and build these, you know, much larger McMansion type things. And, you know, the charm of Kenwood, a big part of its charm is that you've got these small bungalows that just with a little bit of architectural detail make for such an attractive home. I mean, look at the way they've got the shingles on this gable and the little kind of sunburst detail and the braces, the windows and that door. Um, and it's this sort of democratization of style and architecture that is spread throughout Kenwood that makes it so attractive. And they want to they want to preserve that. And I, I think you can see why. So we'll do a Kenwood part two and explore some of the other uh, <laughs> and neighbors, three. The other local historic districts. Well, I think if we did, you know, past where the high school is and then the neighborhood beyond that, because yeah. there were five mayors that lived in Kenwood and a lot of those houses are back in there. So that'll be Kenwood part two. So thank you for joining us at the History Half Hour in Kenwood. Thanks to Jeff. Uh, for opening up the Craftsman House Gallery. Thanks, Jeff Danner, for all your help with information. And Bob Jeffrey, who I know a lot of that information came through, who's another uh, kind of leading figure in the revitalization of, of uh, Kenwood. So thank you all. See you next time.